Prologue of King Arthur, a drama in a prologue in four acts, by Joseph Commons Carr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cast of Characters Narrated by Adrian Maskill King Arthur, read by Algie Pug Sir Lancelot, read by Max Schörlinge Sir Mordred, read by Rick F. Sir Kay, read by Draconis Sir Gawain, read by Alan Mapstone Sir Bedivere, read by Grey Garrett Sir Agravaine, read by Brett W. Downey Sir Percival, read by Eden Ray Hedrick Sir Lavaine, read by David Warner Sir Dagonet, read by Peter Makus Merlin, read by Todd Messenger, read by Elizabeth Clatt Jailer, read by Jason Mills Guinevere, read by Amanda Friday Elaine, read by Elizabeth Clatt Morgan Le Fay, read by Libby Gone. Clarissant, read by Bethany Baldwin. Spirit of the Lake, read by Charlotte Duckett. Lake Spirits, read by Amanda Friday. Read by Eden Ray Hedrick. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Read by Libby Gone. Maidens, read by Amanda Friday. Read by Bethany Baldwin. Read by Charlotte Duckett. Read by Eden Ray Hedrick. Knights, read by Jessa Mills. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Read by Todd. Read by Eden Ray Hedrick. Chorus, read by Todd. Read by Brett Downey. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Read by Eden Ray Hedrick. King Arthur, the Prologue, Excalibur. Scene, the magic mirror, a wide lake with a rocky path descending to the shore. As the curtain rises, there is a faint glimmer on the horizon which gradually spreads over the water to an effect of dawn. Chorus of Lake Spirits Singing Dawn and daytime turn to night, darkness wake to morning light. All the uncounted hours go by, swift as clouds cross the sky, while we maidens of the mere, heedless to the change of year, guard the sword Excalibur. During the concluding bars of the chorus, Arthur, accompanied by Merlin, appears on the summit of the rocky path. What short is this, haunted by mystic sounds that are not earthly? Tis no earthly shore, nor, till this hour, have mortal eyes beheld these fairy sands. Then thou shalt go alone, for here, perchance, thy magic arts have power to lure my soul. Nay, Arthur, have no fear. A mightier power than mine had led thy feet there where I found thee sleeping by the lake. For whilst I watched, a star fell in the sky, and from the vacant space of heaven there came a voice that cried, Awake! The hour hath struck. Now guide him, Merlin, to that caverned home where dwells the sacred sword Excalibur. What is this sword? Look well, and thou shalt see. As he speaks, an arm rises from the lake, holding aloft a jeweled sword set in its scabbard, which gleams with supernatural light. Sword no mortal shall withstand, fashioned by no mortal hand. Long we wait the hour shall bring, England's sword to England's king. He shall wield Excalibur. What thinkest thou, Arthur? Nay, I have no word. Whence comes this sword? Long time. Ere time began, t'was forged beneath the sea. Its glittering blade was tempered by the waves. Sea maidens wrought its jeweled scabbard, and that warrior king whose arm is strong to wield it in the fight shall rule a kingdom that shall rule the sea. For such a sword were well to give the world. With such a sword were well to rule the world. Who is this king? Nay, list, and thou shalt hear. Warrior knight, into thy hand, Monarch of a mighty land, That in unborn years shall be, Monarch of the mightier sea, Great Pendragon's son, to thee, We shall yield Excalibur. 
The sword again slowly sinks into the lake. Who is Pendragon's son? Thou art the man, Pendragon's son, albeit thou knowest it not. For at thy birth I took thee from the court. Deep in the woods, a flower amid the flowers, I watched beside thee, heard thine infant tongue first lisp responsive to the woodland birds, and by thy cradle, swung beneath the stars, taught thee the wisdom that thou should fit a throne. Now art thou called. Stand forth and take thy sword, whose might alone can stay these wasting wars, whose might alone can bring the realm of peace. Arthur, rising. Then was my dream no dream, for while I slept I heard the noise of battle, and I saw the flashing of innumerable spears lightening the dark of heaven. Then I rose and rode into the strife, and where I led the mightiest fell before me, and men cried, It is the king! Yet did I heed them not, for in mine ears there rang a clarion voice which said, Nay, stay not till the end is won. Fight on, thine arm is mightier than theirs. Fight on, an unborn empire claims thy sword. Fight on, they strike for glory, thou for peace. Long time the battle lasted, and the end seemed to far off. Yet at the end it came, and ere my arm grew weary, I could hear a hush upon the thunder, and the noise and cry of war grew fainter, till it fell to echoing silence. Then far off I saw, set in a reddening sky of blood and fire, a face most fair that wore an angel smile, and down the unending avenue of spears it drew towards me, seeming as it came like a white rose-leaf borne upon the tide of crimson war. Whereat I knelt and said, I have fought for thee, thou hast the smile of peace. Yet answer made she none, and I awoke. Ah, thou, who knowest the secrets of the stars, tell me whose face I saw. Nay, ask not that. I will be answered, all the world to me dwells in that smile. Then look upon thy fate. As he speaks, a vision of Guinevere appears. Arthur kneels. Who art thou? Speak. Listen, and thou shalt hear. At this, a chorus of unseen spirits is heard. Fairest form of all the earth, joy and sorrow at one birth, love and beauty, hope and fear, wait for thee in Guinevere. Love and beauty, hope and fear, wait for thee in Guinevere. Thou hearest, Arthur? Nay, I do but see a form too fair for this rough world's embrace, fit for a kingdom that no sword can win. Yet would I win thee, take thee for my queen. Ah, say she shall be mine. Fate answers thee, yet in that gift of beauty lurks thy doom. Love and beauty, hope and fear, wait, wait for thee in Guinevere. These fairy tongues are false, for, see, she bears the emblems of the spring. All the new world leaps into flower about her, and the May trails its white blossom round those stainless brows. Yet thou shouldst know full many a poisonous weed grows rank amid the blossoms of the May. Love and hate are born in May. Love, the bird on the wing. Hate, the worm devouring. All those flowers of yesterday. Wait, Wait for thee in Guinevere. The vision fades. All love's flowers of yesterday Wait for thee in Guinevere. Thou wilt not stay? Then I will seek for thee, And through the world, If thou art of the world, I'll find thee, Crown thee, Guinevere, my queen. All love's flowers of yesterday Wait for thee in Guinevere. And yet those mystic voices chaunt of doom. Ah, thou, whose vision spans futurity, Hath not thy magic art all power to stay the hand of fate? Our knowledge is not power. Who knows the end of life hath reached the end. His wisdom is but death, while ye, who stand eager to thread the winding maze of the world, led on by faith, 
do more than angels dare. Such destiny is thine, for thy right arm out of this mound of earth shall raise a throne whose glory echoes through unacted time. Wherefore I charge thee, ask no more of fate. The hand of doom is patient, and the sword that flashes in the glimmering light of dawn falls not till nightfall. Thou shalt rule thy day. I'll ask no more. I do but crave my sword. The spirit of the lake appears, and at the same time the sword rises again from the lake. Thy prayer is answered. She will give it thee. Arthur, England's chosen lord, fear not fate, but take thy sword. Thou the first whose mortal hand ever hath touched this mystic brand. Sword and scabbard both are thine, sword and scabbard both divine. Guard them well and use them well, so that after time shall tell of thy kingdom in the sea, blazoned on whose shield shall be right and might and liberty. Arthur makes a movement toward the sword. But beware, time's beating wing, restless and untiring, speeds along time's endless way, bravely thou shalt rule thy day. And at last when day is gone, those three queens of Avalon, rulers of the night, who keep in their charge the keys of sleep, far across this mystic mere, silently thy barge shall steer, till thy wearied eyes have won endless sleep in Avalon. He who would rule the day must greet the dawn. There is no hour to lose. Give me my sword, for, echoing through the night, I too can hear the voice of England like a sobbing child that longs for day. And, gathering in night's sky, I see that throng of England's unborn sons, whose glory is her glory. Prisoned souls with faces pressed against the bars of time, waiting their destined hour. Give me my sword, that I may loose time's bonds, and set them free. The chorus is heard, and the picture is held till the fall of the curtain. Great Pendragon's great son, Arthur, ere thy race be run, thou shalt rule from sea to sea, England that is yet to be. Great Pendragon's son, to thee, here we yield Excalibur. End of prologue. Act One of King Arthur, a drama in a prologue in four acts, by Joseph Commons Carr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act One, The Holy Grail. Scene. The Great Hall at Camelot. A wide opening, breast high at the back, flanked by marble columns, through which is seen a view of blue hills against a sunset sky. Sir Kay, Sir Agravain, and Sir Bedivere, to whom enters Sir Lancelot. Sir Lancelot, this falls well. Of late, our king hath oft times asked for thee, and thou shalt learn the noise of thy great deeds hath far outstripped thy good steed's swiftest course. Waiting thee here to swell love's welcome home. What news from Wales? In Wales men speak in whispers. Yet tis known that Ryons, lately joined in secret league with Mark of Cornwall, doth but wait the hour to strike at Arthur's throne. This news comes, Pat. Not three days past, deep in the belt of wood that circles round Carleon's clustering towers, Sir Gawain's huntsman chanced upon two spies, who now lie fast in chains. And at this hour the king holds counsel, and shall straight declare if they may live or die. Should Gawain speak, and Arthur listen, they were dead ere night. That is most sure. Which way doth Mordred tend? Truth, that were hard to tell. His subtle tongue still weaves a web to catch the thought of others, and hide his own. And what then saith the king? He waits upon the word of Guinevere. I dare be sworn this thing hath troubled him. What should he fear, though Mark and Ryan's joined, with all the host of Cornwall and Wales knocked at our gates? Nay, sirs, he knows not fear, whose warrior heart was bred where spears have grown thick as the river reeds. Yet in that heart dwells a fond nursling hope this news will slay. For since the coming of Queen Guinevere, the sword Excalibur hath hung at rest within its jeweled scabbard, and he dreamed the lust of blood. 
was past. Would that were all, King Arthur grieves, but tis with graver cause. What cause? What cause? In truth we do forget. Sir Lancelot knows not that at vesper time a hundred knights of Arthur's fellowship take a long leave of Camelot and the king. Bound on what quest? No earthly quest is theirs who have taken a vow to seek the Holy Grail. To seek the Grail? Now, sirs, you mock at me, for who of mortal born shall hope to find, searching through all the world, that holy cup charged with Christ's blood? That cup no eye hath seen since long ago to this wide isle t'was borne by Joseph, who had filled it at the cross. What heaven hath hid no man may dare to seek, save by a sign from heaven? Heaven's sign hath come, in miracle and wonder three nights past, when all our company was sat in meat, above the murmur of the feast there leapt, the crack and cry of thunder and the roof, was cloven as with a sword, then down the hall, a slant upon a bar of light that gleamed, as though the sun would turn to molten gold, past a white angel, bearing in her hands the sacred vision of the cup of Christ. What like was it to see? During the following speech, the hall darkens. That none may tell, for dimly veiled in a cloth of white, it went as it had come, unseen of all. Yet while it passed it left, though none knew how, the witness of its presence in men's eyes, and dumbly gazing each in other found the stamp of some new glory. Then uprose our youngest knight Sir Percival, and cried, Now thanks for what hath been and what shall be, for here I vow to rest not till these eyes have openly beheld the cup itself. And as one note at dawn will wake the woods, voice after voice re-echoed Percival's, till one by one a hundred of our knights had joined themselves unto this holy quest. If this be so... Why, sir, t'was in this hall. And close upon this hour. A peal of thunder is heard, followed by a lightning flash. What cry was that? Nay, see, tis here again. As he speaks... A slanting ray of light falls through the hall, enfolding the form of a maiden bearing the cup, from the center of which a red light strikes like a star through the transparent veil that covers it. Sir Lancelot kneels as the vision passes and disappears. Ah, go not yet! Tis gone. And did mine eyes not vouch t'was here, I'd say it was a dream, for never yet hath mortal vision gazed on aught so fair. Didst thou not note how all the air was filled with sweetest odours? So it was before. Say we not truth? Lancelot, rising. Ay, and by this I know that age of marvels, long ago foretold by Merlin when he built our table round, hath come at last. And we who live today shall witness wonders great and terrible, shaking the earth, until that happier hour when he whom God hath chosen of us all with mortal eyes shall pierce heaven's mystery, and see the grail itself. T'was said last night that he alone shall win this saving grace, whose heart stands clear of sin. Ay, sir, tis so, and he alone who wills it, so can pierce the secrets of our hearts. Not all may win, yet straining at the goal, there's none can lose the grace that comes of strife. Mordred has entered unseen during the last speech, carrying a scroll in his hand. How now, sir knights, ye do forget the hour. Have ye not heard that they whose names are duly here enrolled, bound by their vows to seek the holy grail, within a breathing space shall take their leave of Arthur and his court? I pray you, sir, of your good grace, add my name to the roll. Hast thou considered well? My lord, I have and shall be ready when the list is called. Exit Lancelot. So Lancelot goes. I dare be sworn he will not, nay, though his oath were loudest of them all, yet Arthur's love will hold him. Mordred, turning fiercely upon Kay. Who dares speak so gross a treason against our lord the king? In truth, Sir Kay, I thought thee worthier of Arthur's love. Nay, sir, I did but think that Lancelot, who is worthier than us all, would go or stay as that same love commands. And thou, and thou, yet think ye that the king, who loves him best and knows him worthiest, would bid him break his vow? Now, hark ye, sirs, 
ye know not him ye worship, and your praise is but vapour that doth hide the sun, but ye shall know him. Nay, sirs, tarry not, but see that all is ready for the king. Be sure, my lord, we shall not fail the king. Exeunt K and other knights. Yea, Arthur's love would hold him, but it shall not. Lancelot shall go, and, in that vacant seat where now his heart sits guardian to the king, and venomed hate shall keep a closer watch, Lancelot shall go. Enter Morgan. Ah, mother, thou art here. What saith the queen? She doth attend the council. And her voice? Is tuned to plead for mercy. Tis well, for Arthur heeds no voice save hers. These dogs whose tongues I feared will now go free. Then tell me, boy, what tidings did they bear? The gathered hosts of Cornwall and of Wales wait but my sign. They shall not wait for long. The year grows green and May Day comes again. Day of thy birth and day of Arthur's doom. Of Arthur's doom? Ay, for twas so foretold, ere yet thine eyes had opened on the world, that he whose hand should strike at Arthur's heart on May Day must be born, and thou art he, for in thy veins an avenging poison flows, distilled in that dark hour when Merlin's lips hailed Arthur as Pendragon's rightful heir, and left me bastard. Ay, yet one thing lacks. Think you, will Lancelot join this holy quest? What should you fear, though Lancelot go or stay? I fear, yet know not what. His loyal love twines around Arthur like a coil of steel that turns the keenest edge. Yea, well I know that while Sir Lancelot stays, the king is safe. Thou fool! The king were safer if he went. What dost thou say? I say what thou shouldst know. The king doth love Sir Lancelot. Aye, too well. Too well, in truth, for next the king stands one who loves him more than well. Not Guinevere? Ay, she. This is thy malice. Think'st thou so? Trust me, tis true. A woman hath no wiles to hide her secret from a woman's gaze whose eyes are never blindfolded. Dost forget when the news came of Lancelot's heavy wound, how she did weep and wail? So did the king. Ay, truth so did the king. Yet that's not all, for later, when the happier tidings came, that, tended by Elaine, his wound was whole, hadst thou but seen her then, the king made glad, but Guinevere's white lips could shape no smile, her jealous heart was torn. If this be so, and a Lancelot loves her too, then all are trapped. Nay, take it not from me, look for thyself. Herald's trumpet heard without. But see, she comes. Take heed and guard thy tongue. Enter Guinevere. Madam, what saith the king? Hast thou not heard? Thy mother's prayer for mercy hath prevailed. The spies are pardoned. Why, then, tis to thee they owe their right to live. Nay, to the king, who, knowing not of fear, fears not to spare, where weaker hearts would slay. Today at eve our knights ride forth upon a holy quest. At such a season then it was not fit that on their spotless banners there should rest the smirch of hireling blood. Madam the king. Enter Arthur with knights attending. Our faithful knights do know the appointed hour. My lord, they wait your call. Give me the roll. Mordred hands scroll to the king. Is all complete? Nay. Truth, I had forgot. One name is lacking there. Whose name is that? Stand there not here enough of goodly knights that I must lose from our great fellowship, but ye would cry for more? Your pardon, sire. I did but learn it now, within the hour. Sir Lancelot hath returned. Well, sir, what then? Guinevere, starting. Sir Lancelot home. Morgan, approaching her. Ay, madam, he is here. Lancelot is welcome home. Yet tis to fear he comes but to depart. What mean you, sir? He, too, my lord, would join this holy quest. Sir Lancelot? Nay, you jest. This shall not be. 
Go straight and send him here. My lord, I will. Exit Mordred. Morgan, thou hast our leave. Exeunt Morgan, ladies of the court, and knights. Nay, good my lord, this troubles thee. It would, and it were true, for, as each added name summed up the list, methought, though all should go, yet one remains. Flower of all knighthood, Lancelot, thou at least shalt stand beside thy king. Yet should he go, thou still hast that which serves thee more than all, thy sword Excalibur, whose mystic blade hath carved this island empire from the sea. Thou hast thy goodly sword. Ay, and my queen, whose dear commands are set as heaven's high voice, lifting me nearer heaven. Trust thy sword, twill serve thee better far. Long time gone by, when this same sword by magic hands was given, old Merlin said, Take heed and guard it well. Yet guard the scabbard too, for that is more e'en than the blade it sheathes. I knew not then if he spoke false or true. I know it now. For at thy coming, Guinevere, my queen, the havoc turned a harvest at thy feet. From out the bellowing throat of war there came a sweeter, softer music, and the earth, new christened by thy smile, broke forth in flower. Thou art our scabbard, and in thy pure soul, where only peace may dwell, our sword lies sheathed. Yet that rich dower thy father gave with thee, that image of the world, our table round, a kingdom's heart set in a rim of steel, forged of the spears of all the goodliest knights of all the earth, that too must count for much. And if he now should fail, that out of all hath shown himself the mightiest, then I think our day draws to its end. Enter Lancelot. Most welcome home. It was but now I learned from Mordred's lips thou too wouldst join this quest. Tis so, my lord. If that same word by other lips was spoken, I'd say tis false. Dost thou so lightly count our long-tried love, that, without word or sign, thou'dst quit our side? Nay, but I wrong thee there, for we are one, and haply thou hast told thy purpose to the queen. Not so indeed. I heard it not till now. Nay, hear me, Arthur. I have no life, no soul that is not thine, no heart but waits some fitting hour to bleed in thy great cause. Yet, couldst thou see that heart and know its present sickness, thou wouldst say, Lancelot, ride forth, thou hast our willing leave. Thinkest thou so? We will speak of this again. Thy voice alone shall bid me go, or stay. Exit, Lancelot. And thou shalt stay, for now I do divine this sickness at thy heart. Turning to Guinevere. Canst thou not guess? Indeed, I cannot. Tis some cause of love that bids him go. Guinevere, starting. Of love? Ay, dear, of love. Didst think that our two hearts had drained love's springs? Thou hast not heard, but ere thy coming hither, "'Twas known that Lancelot wooed the fair Elaine. "'Twas she that nursed him when his wound was sore. "'Ay, true, twas she. "'But even then their loves had drifted wide asunder, "'and of late he has not breathed her name. "'Why, then, tis sure he loves her not. "'In love there's naught that's sure. "'Yet is he framed in such a constant mould "'that truly I believe he loves her still. "'Some little knot hath ravelled up the skein "'that links their hearts.' There needs a woman's wit to set the tangle straight. A woman's wit? Ay, dear, and thine. Indeed, I think not so. Indeed, it is so. Bid Lancelot come to thee. Thy tongue will find a charm that may unlock the guarded secret of his chafing heart. Guinevere does not move. Nay, thou wilt do it. If our all-happy love hath known no jar, then must we search the more to find the missing note for those whose souls are not so finely tuned. Then thou art sure thou art all happy. Nay, how canst thou ask? A little field-flower, lighted by a star, stands but a tiny speck beneath that lamp, which shines o'er half the world. Yet once it dreamed that this great beacon light was all its own. 
"'Tis long since thou hast spoken of thy love. "'Dost know how long?' "'That is the fate of kings, "'whose lives are as a picture for the world, "'not for their own content. "'When we were wed, I dreamt of many an hour "'when we would sit, thy hand in mine, "'recalling that sweet day, "'when, like a flash of sunlight through the trees, "'I saw thy face at Cameliard. But now the busy hours slip by, each new day brings its burden of new duty, and our loves are too long silent. Yet full well thou knowest. Approaching her. Guinevere, interrupting him and making away. Yes, yes, I know. Heed not my idle words. It was a foolish thought that slipped my tongue. I'll do thy bidding straight. Enter Morgan. Your pardon, madam, but the fair Elaine is newly come from Astolat's, and craves an audience with the queen. Now this falls well, so you shall plead for both. Guinevere, to Morgan. I'll see her here. Go tell Sir Lancelot I would speak with him. Exit Morgan. And later, when Sir Lancelot's name is called, tis thou shalt bid him stay. Till then, farewell. Exit Arthur. Guinevere is left alone. Farewell. Am I so weak that every random word can shake my heart? When Arthur said but now, It is some cause of love bids Lancelot go, I trembled like a thief that's trapped at night, For in his godlike gaze I thought I saw the searching eyes of God, Piercing my soul, where lurks the shameful secret of my love that none must know. Ah, me, if Lancelot knew, how he would spurn me! But he shall not know. Wherefore it were better he should go away, for while he was away, within my heart his image dwelt securely, like a star hung high above me, in a stainless sky, a lamp illumined with a fireless flame, that wrought no ill. But now, when he is by, the light grows blinding, and its fiercer rays consume my very soul. She stands wrapped in thought, as enter Elaine. Thy pardon, madam. Morgan bade me come. She kneels as Guinevere turns to her. Indeed, but she is fair. Nay, do not kneel. Elaine rises. What wouldst thou with me? Twas but yester eve, within thy garden by the castle wall, for the first time I saw thee with thy maids, where midst them all thy prouder beauty seemed to wear the gentlest smile. Twas then I thought, could I but see the queen, I tell my heart and win her favour. Now, methinks, I erred. Has then my face so changed? Sweet lady, no! Yet in thy presence my poor lips are dumb. Then I must speak for thee. Sit near me here. Elaine sits at her feet. So, thou art she our great Sir Lancelot loves. I do not wonder. I did think so once. Be sure he loves thee still. Ah, would twere so. Was then his love so sweet? Tell me how sweet. I scarce knew then, for all the uncounted joys of that brief time seemed but an earnest paid from love's unbounded store. Now, when all's lost, remembrance feeds my grief, and drowned in tears brings back each little token of his love that passed unheeded then. There's joy in that. He loved thee once. Methinks I know some hearts would take thy sorrow's burden, but to win what thou dost still possess. But tell me more. Such love, if love it were, could not so end without a cause. Perchance the fault was thine. I think so too, and yet I know not how. The end came all so swiftly. On that day when he rode forth I do remember well I scarce was sad, our parting was so sweet. But when he came again it was as though the night had fallen at noontide. All was changed. What time was that? Ah, madam, thou canst date my sorrow with thy joy. Guinevere, rising suddenly. What dost thou say? Nay, be not angered. So it chanced to fall in that same hour when thou, new-crowned a queen, didst come from Cameliard as Arthur's bride, my love was lost. Twas Lancelot brought thee here. Ay, was it so? In truth, I had forgot. Yes, sure, twas he. And now thou thinkest that I can win thy love again. 
How should that be? Hold Lancelot to thy side. I ask but that. Let him not go to-day upon this quest, whence none perchance shall live to win his way back to King Arthur's court. Ah, bind him here, that so my love by some sweet chance may find the path it missed before, and creep again back to that heart that once did seem its home. Thou dost not answer. Hush! What sound is that? Look, Look not to thy sword. sword. Fame, Fame is but a breath. That, for all reward, brings thee only death. Rise, and go forth with us, who seek the grail, winning for reward, fame that shall not fail. Elaine, who has gone to the back. It is the chant of those who seek the grail. See, they make ready. Lancelot is not there. Go. Leave me now, for I must speak with him, and think what I may do to serve thee best. Elaine kissing her hand. Ah, would I owned thy crown that may command, or thou my love, that so he needs must yield. Exit, Elaine. And would I ne'er had seen thee, for thy words have set my heart on fire. Can it be so, that then when first we met his love did change? It is not so, and his own lips shall speak, and say tis false, or else I shall go mad. Enter Lancelot. Ah, thou art here. Why is thy mind so bent to leave the court? The king would know the cause. Thinkest thou, because thy favour stands so high in fame of earthly deeds, that thou shalt win this heavenly crown? Indeed, I think not so. His eyes alone shall see that holy cup, whose soul stands clear of sin. What boots it then to adventure all upon a hopeless quest? Ay, hopeless, for I may not touch the goal. Yet... Once when I lay stricken nigh to death, by this same vessel of the Sangrail, my hurt was cured. Now, when my heart is pierced, though by no mortal stroke of sword or spear, perchance again that same sweet miracle may heal my deeper wound. I know thy wound. That was so, I should be shamed indeed. Indeed, tis so. Elaine was here but now. I did not dream that all the world could show so fair a maid. No marvel that thy heart is sick with love. Madam, I love her not. Nay, that is false. Think it no shame to own what, in some angry fit, thy tongue denied. My shame lies deeper, seeing I once vowed a love that now lies dead. Elaine's soft eyes will find love's tomb and charm it back to life. Go to her now and plead thy suit again. I warrant she'll find her not too hard. Your wooing is half done. Urge me no more, for here, by heaven, I swear I love her not. Then wherefore wouldst thou enter on this quest? Nay, madam, in thy pity spare me that. I will be answered. Am I not thy queen? Thou art indeed, and therefore hast thy will. I had thought to pass away and leave behind the dear remembrance of thy loyal love I once deserved. But now that too has gone. For thou wouldst wring the secret from my lips that brands me traitor. Traitor? Ay, tis true, and thou hast known it, else thy gracious heart were not so pitiless. Twas for this I've seen those veiled eyes cloak the hate they scorn to tell, when by some evil chance their gaze met mine. For this thy gentle smile took sudden flight when I passed by. No, no! No more, no more. Nay, madam, drink thy vengeance to the fill. I leave the court because I love its queen. Flings himself at her feet. I did not hear thee. Speak that word again. Ay, once again, I love thee. All my shame lies naked at thy feet. I do but crave that here my life may end. Nay, do not rise. There's something I would say yet know not how. For if thy life must end, then so must mine. You cannot guess my shame. Thou hast no shame, save that which my base love hath laid on thee. Indeed I have. Oft when we kneel and pray before God's image, bleeding on the cross, we cheat our souls, for our vain hearts still seek the manhood, not the God. Twas so with me. 
that hour when arthur came it seemed as though christ's hand had beckoned and i knelt to him and in the mist of worship thought i saw the winged heart of love but when you came his great ambassador from camelot i saw love's heart indeed and knew i loved but not the king what sayest thou not the king wouldst make me mad ah me that homecoming when we two rode in silence side by side and all my heart was hungry for a word the blossoms of the springtime turned to flame and yet you spoke not now it is too late she moves away lancelot rising no not too late unless those lips are false ah, hear me now thou wouldst have heard me then my lonely love i could have borne alone counting this mortal life too short a term of exile for my sin but now that's past and through the darkness like a sudden star thy heart stands clear lighting our sweet away nay do not turn thy face thou knowest tis so love speaks at last and love will be obeyed he moves towards her and she turns as if to yield to his embrace when the chant of the knights breaks forth again and the movement is arrested look not to thy love love that lives an hour heaven's voice above calls thee from her hour rise and go forth with us who seek the grail winning from above love that shall not fail yea truth tis love that speaks but not our love the love of heaven of honour and of him rise and go forth with us who seek the grail winning from above love that shall not fail it is their voice that calls and thou wilt go i thought to hold thee here i may not now my shame is dumb yet in thy purer heart i may find grace to save what still remains of my wrecked soul my trust stands all in thee nay trust thyself thy word must be my law wait not for that a woman is too weak to guard what's best and what she loves the best we shall not speak again exit guinevere ay once again when from thy lips shall come the dread command that sends me hence and like a flaming sword love bars the gate of this new paradise which love hath won yet through the desert night of life's long pilgrimage one star shall stay and when death comes at last to end our quest my fainting heart shall quicken at the thought twas thou didst bid me go enter a squire ah thou art here put on my sword the trumpet sounds as arthur enters preceded by a procession of priests and choristers chanting the song of the grail while the hall fills with a throng of knights arthur and guinevere take their places on the throne on the steps of which stands elaine next the queen look not to thy sword fame is but a breath that for all reward brings thee only death rise and go forth with us who seek the grail winning for reward fame that shall not fail at the close of the chaunt percival comes forward from the group of the knights of the grail and kneels before arthur here at thy feet for all whose vows are sworn i kneel and crave thy favour ere we go what strange new ways our wandering feet will press what dread adventures wait us none can tell yet this we know our fealty to thee shall stand unbroken and through all the world we bear the spotless blazon of thy fame. Rise, Percival, and ye who kneel with him, take your new way. Ye have our leave to go, yet which, if that might be, we could withhold. The magic circle of our table round is broken here, wherefore, in truth, my heart is sore within me, and my lips hold back the message of farewell. Yet must it be, for well I know your vows are sworn to him whose voice outbids the mandate of a king. Therefore, ride forth. We wait your glad return. Percival passes out, followed by the other knights of the Grail, who kneel as they pass the throne. At the last comes Lancelot. Arthur stops him. Nay, Lancelot, what is this? My lord, 
I too would take those vows that bind me to this quest. Arthur, to Guinevere. Didst thou not speak with him? I did, my lord. Then had thy voice no power? In truth, I think some mightier voice than mine doth bid him go. Then I must speak. This quest is not for thee, for thy rich manhood hath a holier task. Here by thy king to fight for this poor world, Till that last call which sheathes our swords in sleep. My lord, thou knowest me not. I am not fit to stand by thee. Nay, Lancelot, it is thou that dost not know thyself for what thou art. This crippled realm, how shall it find the goal, If thou, the strongest, who hast been our staff, If thou, the mightiest, who hast been our shield, and thou, the gentlest, that art now our guide, seek thine own way towards heaven. And so dost steal the sun's bright rays wherewith to seek the sun, leaving this lonely world to grope its way in darkness to the end. Thou shalt not go. My lord, did I but know myself as strong as is the weakest of these knights whose vows were sworn but now, it would not need thy voice to bid me stay. Still thy resolve stands firm. Then thou shalt hear a sager voice than ours. Old Merlin, by whose mystic craft we read the unturned page of time, stand forth and speak. Merlin steps forward. All shall seek the holy grail. All and all save one shall fail. Nay, leave thy riddles. Shall he go or stay? Fate doth not answer yea or nay. Love shall bid him go or stay, love the best or love the worst, holiest love or love accursed. Say on, what is this love that bids him go? I can but read the words that faith hath writ. Then we have done with fate. Go, get thee hence, and never more shall that dark face of thine pass like a withered shadow through these halls. I go hence. Yet fate shall stay till the dawn of that dread day. He, Pendragon's son, shall slay that is born with the May. As Merlin goes out, the hall grows darker, and the sunset at the back gleams more brightly. My lord, I pray you call him back again. Nay, heed him not, my queen, nor Lancelot thou. For if indeed love speaks with double voice, one base, one noble, then be sure my lips do bear the nobler message, for the world tells of no higher, purer love than that of brother unto brother. Such, in truth, is my great love for thee, that bids thee stay. I know not how to answer for myself. Yet, once before, when we were at debate, the verdict of our queen did end all strife. I crave it now. Her word shall be my law. Then thou shalt stay. For she and I are one, with but one voice, one tongue, one heart, one soul. Now, Guinevere, declare thy will. My lord, a woman is too weak to rule men's hearts. Not so, my queen. Hath not thy purer heart, so ruler over him who rules this realm, won from rude wars that sweeter crown of peace that smiles upon our land from sea to sea? And wouldst thou fail me now, when, on thy word, the welfare of a kingdom waits in doubt? Wouldst thou be dumb? Indeed, indeed I would. Nay, I command thee, speak as I would speak. Ay, madam, speak. My life lies in thy word. Guinevere, without looking at Lancelot. My lord, I do thy bidding. Lancelot, stay. The knights of the grail file past, singing as they go. Ere those lips be dumb, that would bid thee stay. Ere the night be come, rise and come away. We who go forth to seek the Holy Grail, win ere night be come, light that shall not fail. End of Act One Act Two of King Arthur, a drama in a prologue and four acts, by Joseph Commons Carr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Act Two, The Queen's Maying. Scene. The slope of a hill in springtime studded with bushes of whitethorn. A company of maidens, garlanded with white may, descend the slope. They are followed by Guinevere and her ladies. The May Song. Ere upon its snowy bed lies the firstborn of the spring. Ere the crocus lifts its head, or the swallow finds its wing. Love is here. Say ye then, earth's flower shall fade. We shall tell ye nay. Love, the first of all flowers made, loves from May to May. He beneath whose sun-kissed feet daisies rise to kiss the sun, lily, rose, and meadow sweet. Love, that is all flowers in one, love is here. Heed not then the blooms that fall, dying with the day. Love, the sweetest flower of all, lives from May to May. Here, on the verge of this untravelled wood, Beneath love's flowering banner we have set our camp of war. For know ye, ladies all, that dread of adventure, whereunto ye are called, is no poor mockery of a tournament, such as our lords love, jousting for a prize. Our cause is mortal, and those unseen swords we women wield are forged to pierce men's hearts, whereat, if any cheek grow white with fear, let its poor owner straight away quit the field. Nay, all are brave. Tis well. Ere day had dawned, our scouts and spies, which are the winged birds, reported that a band of swaggering knights did challenge our approach. Gainst them we war. Yet hear me. Not like timorous men who find their courage grow from fellowship in fear, wherefore in serried ranks they face their foe. Our greater strength hath ever best been proved in single combat. So we fight to-day nor need these fairer faces be encased in casks of steel. That never was our plan, for so indeed we should but hide from view all love's bright armoury that lodges there. But truth, I waste my breath where all are skilled in these same arts of war. Therefore set forth, each on her chosen way, for in this wood lurks many a pleasant bower or roofed with green, where moss and harebells weave a patterned floor with shifting tracery of added gold shot from the sun's eyes, peeping through the boughs of flowering thorn. There should each lady lead her conquered knight, that so, by gentler arts, her love may cure the wounds that love hath made. So, fare we all till sunset. Haste, away! As they move towards the wood, Dagonet rushes in and falls on his knees before the queen. He bears a large, rough garland of flowers hanging about his neck like a horse-collar. Dagonet who is trembling with mock fear. Sweet ladies, save me, though ye love me not. I am so oppressed. What? Hath some beast pursued thee? Ay, truth, a most sweet beast, yet fearsome too. I pray you, madam, let us call these knights. We are in danger else. Is this your valour, that so you quake at shadows? Shame on ye. Ay, shame, for here is a beast that will harm no lady though at this budding season tis very fatal to man. I would hear more of this beast. What form hath it? Well, to be plain yet modest withal, and not too curious, it is in all things shaped like a woman. Truly, a very monstrous woman that would so pursue a fool. Faith, there be many such, though tis only your sage fool that fears them. Rise, Dagonet, and tell us how it chanced. Then stiffen your sinews, for tis a heart-breaking legend. Hither came I through the wood, thinking of naught, and so counting myself wise beyond my years, when of a sudden I espied a maid who tended a herd of swine. Whereat I do confess it, I fell a-weeping bitterly, for surely never was a mortal woman so fitly employed. You hear him, madam. Nay, let him run on. Ay, tis the finish that will cause ye to quake. For this same maid, not content with her most righteous calling, and happily moved by my tears, most artfully flung this halter about my neck, and swore a most villainous oath that she loved me well. For I, being, as tis known, only half a fool, slipped from her embrace, and fled incontinently. Now thou art half a man, and therefore a most complete fool, that could so dread to be loved. Wherein thou art wrong, for I have a leaning that way, being very tenderly fashioned, and with a taste for red lips. But alack, I am troubled with a most constant heart, 
and that goes not with love. How say you? Is it so wise to rail against constancy? Nay, I would question thee. Canst tell me now what is most like to a river that drains to the sea? Faith, I cannot. Why, a maiden who weeps in the rain. Where hast thou seen that? Last night, where I sheltered from the storm, there passed a lady sobbing as she rode, and with her tears the rain kept even tune. "'Twas a sweet contest, yet I'll warrant her eyes outstayed the dripping of the sky. "'Knew you her face?' "'Twas laid so low upon her palfrey's neck, I saw it not. "'Go, fool, on your way.' "'I, madam, by your leave, for I must seek the king who comes from hunting. "'In Maytime your king and your fool were ever very prettily assorted.' "'He goes up the hill singing.' The cuckoo's note doth haunt the may, and some are glad, and some grow mad, but the fool goes singing on his way. Exit Dagonet. As he goes, the queen stands wrapped in thought. Nay, madam, see, tis noon. We waste our day. Guinevere, rousing herself. Truly. Lift up your voices. Let us on. Dreaming neath the white and thorn. Like, like a rose leaf on the snow, lovers, ere the day be born, ye shall find him and shall know. Love is here, and at nightfall when we part, whispering shall say, Love is lord of every heart, love is lord of May. The ladies wander off through the wood, preceded by the company of singing maidens, whose voices grow gradually fainter as they are lost in the distance. And at the last, Guinevere follows slowly, and as she goes off, Morgan enters and stands gazing after her, while at the same time Merlin appears on the rising path above. March on, my queen, in all thy bravery. He that is lord of May and of thy heart, blind leader of the blind, shall draw thee on, where Lancelot waits for thee, love, slave, and ours. The scabbard's gone. But England's lord holds till death the naked sword. Morgan, seeing him. What wouldst thou now whose work is well nigh done? May Day is here, and we, thy ministers, need no fresh spur to hasten fate's decree. Merlin, approaching her. At dawn I heard the splashing of the mare, and saw that jeweled scabbard sink and sink, till, like a glittering rainbow, down the deep it vanished, and the shuddering tide grew still. Doth thou know'st aught of this? Not I, forsooth. Thou liest. For I tracked thee in thy theft, and saw thee creep beside the sleeping king, whose hand held fast that naked blade which gleamed, a bar of quivering moonlight, by his side. Thou hast stolen the scabbard, but no mortal hand shall take the sword. What then? Thyself did say the scabbard's worth doth far outweigh the sword. To him, but not to thee. "'Tis not to thee, who steals the scabbard, doth but draw the sword. "'Who holds the sword, holds all save life, and wins, "'though life be spent, a deathless crown from death. "'Whose hand shall take it, then, when death draws near?' "'When those queens of night shall steer Arthur's barge across the mare, "'she, who long ago did bring England's sword to England's king, "'she shall claim Excalibur.'" Exit Merlin Croak on, let death but come, we'll chance the rest. Enter Mordred. Whose voice was that? Twas Merlin's, who grows old and babbles like a child. What is thy news? Beyond our hope, Ryans and Mark are joined in equal strength of war, and, by this hour, their glittering squadrons, like a serpent, coil around Carlion's walls. Whence got you this? Sir Maurice from Carlion rode post haste to warn our master. He will ride no more. Touching his sword. Tis well. Your men keep watch on every road? Ay, all are guarded. Let but this day pass with no unwelcome note to wake the king, then war may shriek its loudest. All is sure. Hast thou forgotten Lancelot? What of him? Nay. Track him through the wood, and thou shalt learn. Come hither. See where, trembling hand to hand, With speechless answering eyes they woo the spring. Love sets the snare, but the caged bird is ours. 
for ere night's dusky arms enfold the sun, Lancelot shall be thy partner and thy slave. Exeunt Morgan and Mordred. The May song is heard faintly in the distance. Enter Sir Lavaine and Clarissant. Dost think our love will live from May to May? Nay, ask me that when May Day comes again. Ah, tell me now. I'll tell thee all I know. If thou dost woo me well, I'll love thee well. Should no one woo me better? Wouldst thou be wooed that art already won? Most surely, sir. Who holds my heart must win it every day. And when tis won, tis then it must be wooed and won again. Why, twas but yesterday that thou didst swear thy love would last till death? Ay, that was yesterday. And shall thine oath live but an hour? What is there in these oaths that you poor men so fondly cherish them? Perchance they fit your duller brains, which seek with empty words to bind the unborn hours. But we do wrong to humour you in this. We should not swear at all, knowing full well there's no tomorrow in a woman's heart, which hath its yesterdays of joy or pain, whose savour lingering on our lips to-day makes all the present half a memory the future all a blank then ask me not if i shall love thee when the year is worn i loved thee yesterday so be content ah but thou lovest to-day to-day is young ask me at sundown i will tell you then exit laughing and he following her enter guinevere and lancelot the wood is dark let us be in the sun twas dark ere yet the glory of thy face came like a golden message from the sun and now beneath this open vault of day twould change again to night wert thou not here i had a foolish fear i should not find thee nay guinevere thou knowest that could not be indeed tis true for wandering alone across the leafy screen that hedged my way from every side i heard the echoing laugh of love's encounter then the wood grew still, and softer than the silence came the sound of whispered vows from lips but newly met, and then, beneath an opening arch of green, two lovers passed, with hand in hand locked close. Ah, Lancelot, I was lonely as a child locked in a darkened room. I called thee then. Didst thou not hear me? I, and saw thee, too. Thou didst not answer? Nay, forgive me, sweet. I could but watch thee. That was cruel, sir. Twas but an instant. No, it was a year, and in that year a thousand thronging fears with devil faces perched amid the boughs. What were thy fears? So many all in one, that I should lose thee. Lancelot putting his arms around her. Never until death. Ah, speak not so of death. I have seen a face that frighted me like death. Lancelot, starting. Whose face? And where? Within the wood. Twas Merlin's. But so old, Lancelot. So old and worn I knew it not. Those empty words of his do haunt thee still. I wonder at thy fears. Nay, scold me not. There's nothing haunts me when I have thee near. Love shuts the door on all things save itself, on all that's past, on all that is to come when thou art by. Tell me, tis so with thee. Ay, sweet, tis so. Ah, say it once again. I could not live, Lancelot, if in thy heart there lurked the tiniest little ache or pain love might not cure. Thou knowest all my heart, and in my love, which knows no law but love, the future and the past are drowning straws caught in the full tide of our present joy that neither ebbs nor flows. He holds her in a close embrace as Morgan and Mordred enter stealthily. At the same time is heard the sound of distant thunder, and the scene darkens. Dost mark them well. Ambition, honour, duty, all that life once held most dear, by thy sweet will subdued, now wear love's livery and would serve love's queen. The thunder is heard again and nearer. Guinevere, starting. What sound was that? See, it grows dark again. Tis but a cloud. It came like sudden night. Let us go in. 
thunder again. Ah, tis the thunder's bolt that cracks the sky. Nay, tremble not, twill pass, and leave heaven's deeper blue. What shouldst thou fear? I know not. Hold me closer, closer still, so that my heart may catch the fearless tune of thy heart's steadfast music. Now I am brave, and could be always what thou always hear. So let us on. Yet tell me o'er again. Ah, I do tease thee. Tis but this once more. Tell me, whate'er befall, that thou art mine. For ever and for ever, I am thine. A crash of thunder and a lightning flash. Mordred looking after them. He lies, my queen. Not thine, but mine till death. End of Act Two Act Three of King Arthur, a drama in a prologue in four acts, by Joseph Commons Carr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, The Black Barge. Scene. A vaulted chamber opening on to the river. As the curtain draws up, enter Sir Lancelot, followed by Sir Kay, Sir Gawain, and Sir Agravaine. Sir Maurice slain? Ay, murdered. But by whom? That's still to find. Know you from whence he came? Straight from Caerleon, whither, as I heard, he rode with sealed advices for the king. Said I not well? Arthur hath been forestalled. Why? "'Twas but yesterday the king did note his long delay. "'It was but yesternight we found him murdered. "'Sirs, if this be so, there's something more than murder. "'More in truth. Lancelot, some traitor lurking near the throne, "'in secret league with Arthur's enemies, by this same villainous act, "'now stands possessed what the king should know. "'What must be done?' "'Let Lancelot speak.' "'I'll straightway to the king and tell him all.' Then, should we win his leave, at nightfall we'll to horse, nor draw the rein until Caerleon's towers cut the sky. Exeunt K, Agravain, and Gawain. During the next speech, Mordred enters. Whose hand is here? Of all our knights, but one in my most secret heart dare stand accused of this foul deed. Turns and sees Mordred. Mordred! Morris is slain. Sir Morris slain? Nay, tis some idle jest. That is not all. The advices that he bore are stolen. Stolen? Is it possible? Ay, sir, and true, which news must to the king. Most surely, yet not now. He is fatigued and would not be disturbed. Tomorrow, sir. Nay, sir, today. An hour's delay may risk the safety of his throne, perchance his life. Well, sir, what then? What then? Nay, spare thy skill. Tis aptly feigned. In faith, I'd say twas true, did I not hold a key that locks thy heart. What dost thou mean? I mean, should Arthur pass... He leaves behind a kingdom, and a queen who loves him not. Who says so foully lies? Lancelot, throw off this mask, it fits thee not. Be what thou art, nor fear what thou wouldst be. Let candor answer candor. It was I who slew this messenger. His papers here bring rich news that ere a week be past, Carlion's gates must yield to the assault of Ryan's siege, whose vengeance stays not there. The king himself is doomed, and, the king dead, his throne is mine, and thine his widowed queen. Traitor! I knew it! Thou shalt to the king, in whose dread presence, from that villain's throat, I'll force those words again. I dare thy worst. Yet breathe one word, and I will tell a tale shall make thee cower like a beaten hound. Thou'st naught to tell. What? Are her kisses naught? 
fie, sir, for shame. So then thou didst not guess I lurked so near, and saw thee lip to lip, cuddling beneath the may. That is love's trick, who blindfold deems that all the world is blind. Now to the king. See, sir, the way is clear. What, wouldst thou pause? Hast thou no heart to win that sweet reward that waits thy loyal zeal? A traitor's death? What were that death to me? True, but the queen. Vile wretch! Movement towards Mordred. Look where she comes. Take thought with her. She will advise thee well. We men are rash. A woman's subtler wit serves better in such case. Truth, but she's fair, so fair. Why, Lancelot, I repent me now I kept not this sweet morsel for mine own. Out of my sight. His tongue is safely gagged. Yet he's but half corrupt. I'll trust him not. Exit. Lancelot stands in despair as Guinevere enters. Who went from thee? T'was Mordred. Guinevere, approaching him. Lancelot, some evil hath befallen. Tis not. He turns away. Tis much can make thee turn from me. Ah, but I'll know it. Didst thou not swear our love could cure all ill? Then tell me all. Caerleon is besieged. Should succour fail, twill yield to Ryan's arms. Who brings these tidings? Mordred. And the king? Knows not. Knows not? Lancelot, ah oh no, ah oh no, sure thou wouldst tell the king. Indeed, I would. Then wherefore pause? Oh, had I died but then, in that sweet hour when first I learned thy love, I had been happy. What is in thy heart? Mordred is false. False? Aye, tis he that's hatched this plot against the king, whereby he thinks to seize the throne. Then thou shalt prove him false and save the king. I dare not. Dare not? No, all, all is known. To whom? To him. He was there beside us in the May. His traitorous hand grips at my throat and makes me traitor too. No, no, that cannot be. Ah, look not so. What wouldst thou do? Nay, ask what I have done. Was there no lamp in heaven to stay our feet? Was the night starless that we needs must wait till love's torch, setting all the world ablaze, lights up love's ruinous way? Ah, Guinevere, I die a hundred deaths, but now to win one hour of life that's past. I, one short hour, so I might drag this devil to the throne and shout his villainies in every ear. Then do it now. I cannot. Yea, thou canst. Who is there that should stay thee? Tis not I. Let love go down the wind. What boots it now? Look to thyself. Think not of all that's lost. That is all mine. For thee there still remains thy soldier's honour. Take it. Keep it pure. What have I said? Ah, go! Throws herself on couch. Lancelot, throwing himself at her feet. My queen, my queen! There's nothing in the world to win or lose can count beside thy love. I lied but now. King, honour, country. All that knighthood boasts of faith and loyalty in life or death weighs not against the memory of one kiss from thy dear lips. Then thou art mine again. To hear thee say that all the world was not against our love hath made me mad for joy. Yet stay not now. I have a thought to think, and needs must be alone. Yet, ere I go, hear this one word. All that is left of life is thine to keep or thine to fling away, so I may have thy love. Exit Lancelot. Thou hast indeed. So all is won again, and all is lost. So do we strive that we may have the more to cast away. And now, when at my feet he lays his sword, his life, I and his soul, 
I do but long to find some better way to give him all again. I, all again. Looks off. It is the king. How may I find that way? Enter Arthur. Ah, thou art here. I bring thee such sad news as must needs wring thy heart. What news, my lord? Elaine is dead. Dead? Who hath told thee this? There, yonder by the shore, her body lies, who, while she lived, was named the fair Elaine. Canst thou not weep? Truly, my lord, I think I've lost the use of tears. Thou wouldst have wept, hadst thou been there, when down the vacant stream that black barge floated, like a speck of night, blown on the winds of dawn, and on its deck, fallen as a feather from a white dove's wing, lay this new prize of death, whose cunning hands had wrought in such fair mimicry of life that on her parted lips there lingered yet the memory of a smile. Why, then, perchance she's happier far than some who needs must live and smile no more? It may be, for that brow had caught from death some secret of content it knew not here, and looking in those eyes whose tears had ceased their traffic, I dared think, if aught of sin was there, tis pardoned now. Of sin? What sin? Ay, for it must be so. Some sin there was, though unrecorded here. Some stain that smirched her seeming purity, which Lancelot, all too noble, could not urge. Else were it not in nature to refuse so sweet a gift. If that indeed be true, were it enough to shut the doors of love? Enough? What wouldst thou ask? Ay, ay, enough, enough and more. Yet, in some greater heart, as his or thine, methought that love might find forgiveness e'en for that. Nay, wrong him not, whose upward gaze, set level with the stars, would lift from earth the soul he crowns with love, making her more than woman. Whence, if she fall, like some lost planet hurled from highest heaven, she falls to endless night. During Arthur's speech, the distant throb of a mournful march is heard slowly approaching. Most like tis so, and death the only way. What sound is that? Up from the stream they bear her body hither, where it shall rest beneath his royal roof, till, with such liberal honours as befit so fair a flower, tis set again in earth. The procession enters, headed by Mordred and Morgan. Four knights bear Elaine and are followed by a company of maidens. Morgan, aside to Mordred. Her cheek grows pale. She will betray herself. She passes across the stage and takes her place behind the queen. At a sign from Mordred, the knights move forward till they come to where Guinevere is standing rigid and motionless. Then they stop in silence till Guinevere, without turning, cries in agony. Go on and set it down. Mordred, coming forward. Madam, by your leave, in that white hand of death a letter lies, whose seal we dare do not break, for tis inscribed to Guinevere, the queen. Arthur to Guinevere. Then break the seal, which hides perchance some secret of her love we know not yet. Guinevere tries to approach the bier, but cannot touch the body. Then, with a despairing appeal, she turns to Arthur. I cannot. Give it to me. Arthur takes the letter which Guinevere opens and lets fall, staggering back into the arms of Morgan, whose eyes gleam in triumph. Nay, madam, nay. What is it moves thee thus? Mordred picks up the letter and gives it to the king. Arthur, reading. I that was named Elaine of Astolat, whose mortal love for Lancelot passed all measure, seeing he loves another, choose to die. We knew not this. Go, call Sir Launcelot here. My lord, my lord. She struggles forward as though to stop the king's command, and then swoons into Morgan's arms. Look to the queen. Morgan and her women support her from the stage, and at the same time the knights lay the body of Elaine under the alcove, and then exeunt, leaving Arthur and Mordred alone. Mordred, aside. Ere Lancelot's blow can fall, I'll strike him to the heart. Arthur, holding the letter. If this be true, tis strange that none had known. What's that, my lord? 
What's here set down of Lancelot's later love? Now would to heaven those words had ne'er been writ or ne'er been read. Why so? Didst thou not note how the queen's soul was stirred? She is not used to look on death which coming in such guise might move our soldier hearts ay but methought it was death's message and not death itself that turned those red lips white mordred what's this think you the queen hath known of this same love nay i'll not answer that nay but thou shalt what is to fear my lord thou art my king my sword is thine and with that sword my life but with that life my loyal service ends, and what is left thou wilt not ask of me. Who is it that he loves? In sooth, I thought what all the world had known was known to thee. Were it not so, these lips had still been dumb. But now tis best t'were said he loves the queen. Who forged this lie? Nay, Mordred, tis not thou and yet i wonder too to find thee duped by this poor tale bred in some baser soul that loves not lancelot what thou think'st tis false why then my lord tis false i'll think so too we'll speak of it no more ay but we will and track this running poison to its source which else should turn all the pure springs of life to pools of festering filth. Enter Morgan hurriedly. My lord, the queen, why art thou pale? Nay, do not take it so. Twas but a sudden fit, and will soon pass. Morgan, come hither. Knowst thou aught of this? Of what, my lord? Of Lancelot's love for her, uh, the queen. The queen? Now who hath told thee this? Turning to Mordred shame on thee shame i pray you heed him not i would have cut my tongue out ere i had spoken such evil of our mistress let him be he doth but hint what every hawker cries but he did wrong to speak and thou to hear so sweet a lady and at such an hour were i a man for all he is my child my sword should answer him now this is more than i have will to bear why twas thyself didst tell how yesternight sir lancelot went to her bower alone didst thou say so in truth twas so and hath been so before yet did i think no wrong and now i'm sure he bore some message from the king himself no he did not well then be sure twas not and she shall prove it not nay mother nay let us be honest thou wouldst serve the queen and so would i yet may we not be false to him whom heaven hath made her lord and ours how canst thou say twas not why thou wast there beside me when they kissed beneath the may arthur turns slowly towards morgan tell him he lies my lord my lord i cannot there'll come a time when i shall know full well this is a dream but now i'll play it out as though twere true go get thee to the queen think not too ill of her nay nor of thee exit morgan to mordred go on there's more to come think you he knows you lurked so near and saw him ay most sure for now with lying tongue he goes about whispering that I have hatched some treacherous plot against thy throne and thee. Why, when I think, this is some other Lancelot ye have met, and this some other king. He whom I knew was of all knights the bravest and the truest, serving a lord who could not have stood dumb to hear his name befouled. Lancelot enters and approaches the king, who does not turn to him. My lord, I am here. Didst thou not send for me? Ay, so I did. Lancelot, the scabbard of Excalibur, is stolen. Who is the thief? This thou shalt say, dost think tis Mordred? Lancelot, starting. Why should I think so? Why not? I have heard there is some grosser charge that thou wouldst bring against him. Nay, my good lord. Let Lancelot speak. Lancelot, after a pause. My lord, I bring no charge. 
Lancelot, think well. Art sure thou knowest of naught that should disturb our peace? Lancelot, after a pause. Of naught, my lord. Tis well, tis well. Then both of ye are true. Was it for this that thou didst send for me? Not so. Come hither, that thine eyes may feast on this sweet picture. Lancelot turns and starts at the sight of Elaine. Nay, sir, note it well. Death too hath gone a-maying, and hath plucked life's fairest flower. Elaine. Methought she slept. Ay, past all waking. And wouldst know the cause? The cause? Why she doth sleep. Tis written here. He gives Lancelot the letter. As the king watches him, he reads it, and then falls on his knees before the bier. Yet squander not thy grief. She heeds thee not. The dead are dead. We give them ne'er a thought whose care is for the living, and of all the most for thee. Where'er she may dwell this new-found beauty that hath lured thy heart, we shall command her love. Nay, but we shall, for thou art known the courtliest, truest knight that ever served a king. Then speak her name. My lord, in truth, Nay, sir, who is this maid? There is no maid. Lancelot, thou sayest well. It is the queen. Uh, no. Thou knowest tis so. Thou art the thief who so hast stolen away that scabbard that was worth a hundred swords. Whose tongue hath told thee this? Here on my life I'll answer him who dares accuse her honour. Then answer me. Liar! And so I will, yet first I'd have thee known for what thou art. Traitor, I charge thee now. Said I not well? Guinevere enters unseen. If he be traitor, what art thou whose sword strikes at my heart, yet would defend my throne? Prove this is false, and I'll believe him false. Prove that he lies, and I'll believe thee true. Again, I swear tis false. Guinevere, coming between them. Nay, nay, tis true. What hast thou done? All that was left to do. Ay, all. There is no more to do or say. Death's banner floats above the blackened field. The fight is ended, and our day is done, if this be so. But I'll not think tis so. Take back that word, and none shall know twas said. Ah, call it back again, and lift the bow death spreads upon my heart. So shall I kneel and bless thee, and this sword shall strike him dumb that dares to whisper aught against my queen. She stands immovable. Is this so much to ask? Ay, all too much. There is no might can give back to the spring its lowliest flower dead under changing skies. Then how should I, with winter at my heart, Plead with the ruined summer for its rose. Thou hast no word? No word to cure what's done. Arthur, to Lancelot. Then arm thyself. My sword shall find its sheath deep in thy heart. Strike on. Strike on, I say. For death is all I crave. Then take it now. Arthur runs on Lancelot, but the uplifted sword drops from his hand. I cannot kill thee. Some sudden posy doth beat down this arm. Its strength is gone. Yet think not tis the love I bore thee once, that's clean forgotten now, nor is it mercy, for had the same wrong chanced to the meanest hind that calls me king, my sword had leapt in vengeance, and my soul had straight approved the deed. Yet here I stand that cannot strike a blow in mine own cause. Is this a curse that heaven hath set on kings, who may not love nor hate like common men? Or is there some rank poison in a crown that stamps the brand of coward on the brows of him who wears it? Go, then, get thee hence. Join with some foe that dares assault our throne. With Bryons, or with Mark, who hunger still for open war, I league thyself with them, and in that hour the hand that falters now in england's cause shall find its force again and strike thee to the earth till then live on 
Lancelot goes out as Arthur turns to Mordred. Leave us alone. There's something left to say. Mordred, that's not for thee. Exit, Mordred. And must I live? It is too late to die. Too late, too late. Ay, would death's marble finger had been laid on those sweet lips when first they linked with mine. Pointing to Elaine. For locked in death's white arms, love lies secure, in changeless sleep that knows no dream of change. Tis life, not death, that is love's sepulchre, where each day tells of passionate hearts grown strange, and perjured vows chime with the answering bell that tolls love's funeral. If thou wouldst boast of this new sway a woman's wile hath won, go, tell the world thy heart hath slain a heart that once had been a king's. Yet that's not all. Thou too hast been a queen whose soul shone clear, a star for all men's worship, and a lamp set high in heaven, whereby all frailer hearts should steer their course towards God. Then, tis not I whose life lies broken here, for at thy fall a shattered kingdom bleeds. At the end of this speech a sound of warlike music is heard, and the stage fills with knights headed by Gawain and Agravain. My lord, my lord, Carleon is besieged. Enter Mordred. And we thy knights, here armed and ready, do but wait to know our king's command. Then let me lead them forth. The chance is desperate, and thy greater life is England's, not thine own. Nay, thou shalt stay. Thou art the one thing left my soul dare trust, for in this wreck of love truth stands for all. Sound out for war. Pointing to Guinevere. Yet, pray you, use her well. We do not roughly trample down the flower that grows upon a grave. Then use her well, for there entombed lies one who was my queen. Go in, I come. The king shall lead thee forth. My sword is drawn. I want no scabbard now. Arthur holds up his naked sword, and all the knights raise their swords in answer as the curtain falls. End of Act Three Act Four of King Arthur, a drama in a prologue in four acts, by Joseph Commons Carr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four The Passing of Arthur. Scene One The Queen's Prison in the Castle at Camelot. Door leading to the Queen's Chamber. Another door heavily barred. Window at back. Gaoler discovered keeping guard, as the scene opens, knocking at outer door. Who knocks without? One who bears a message for the Queen. Gaoler opens door and admits the messenger. What saith Sir Mordred? May she see her fool? Ay, I have brought him hither. That will content her much. She hath cried often for her fool. Yet methinks she shall suck but poor entertainment from the fellow now. His wits are clean gone and faith he is not like to smile again. What mean you, sir? The news of Arthur's death is now made sure, and what is worst, tis said t'was Lancelot's sword that struck him down. Who shall tell this to the Queen? Within the hour Sir Mordred comes himself to bear the news. Think you t'will stir her heart? Indeed I think not so. Look where she comes, her white face like the headstone at a grave, or a lettered, with the story of a day that ended long ago. Enter Guinevere. She holds a bird in her hands. See what I've trapped. It fluttered at the bars and fell there at my feet. I'd have it caged, that I, its gowler, may have leave to dream that I am free. And then, perchance, one day this little bird will come and pray to me, who, being a queen, must needs be merciful and break its wicker walls. Gaoler, taking the bird. I'll cage it now. He goes towards door, and she sees the messenger. Ah, sir, you're from the court. Where is my fool, Sir Dagonet? Is that denied me too? T'was not so much to ask. Madam, he's here, and yet so changed, I fear he will not know thee. Opens door, and Dagonet enters. That counts for naught. I scarce do know myself. Come hither, Dagonet. Sirs, by your leave. Gaoler and messenger, Ixion. 
Dost thou not know thy queen? Ay, very well, there were two of them. For there was one, look you, that came with the spring from Camelard, and she had a face that touched heaven, and there was one that kept a poison on her lip for Lancelot's kissing. And hark ye, last night, beneath the moon, I saw them both kneeling beside a grave. Whose grave? I know not, for the stone was bare, and they did not but weep. I'll tell thee, then. This grave, I think, was Guinevere's, who died that hour when she was born, and these two queens who through the night keep watch beside her tomb, are but her shadows, fashioned for the mask which men call life, poor puppets that must dance while unseen fingers touch the trembling strings. But whence that music comes, from heaven or hell, there's none shall say, till all life's lamps burn out, and death stands forth to claim the harper's fee. Enter Gaelder. Make room. Sir Mordred comes. Enter Mordred. Exeunt, Gaelder, and Dagony. Great queen, I bear thee news that sets thee free. What news is that? Thy lord, the king, is dead. Dead? Art thou sure? Why then, sir, he is free, and I that was his gaoler may not weep. Yet count not that against me, for I think tears are not all. Truth, thou wert wrong to weep. Dost thou not know t'was Arthur's cruel will that set thee in this prison? Ay, I know, that thou hast said t'was so. And so it is. But now I've come to break these prison bars, and so give back unto our desert world life's sweetest rose that hungers for the sun. And who art thou whose new-found sovereignty rides o'er the king's decree? I am thy king. There is no king save one, and he is dead. Yet if it was his will to leave me here, why, here I'll stay. Nay, then thou dost not guess the gift I bear thee. Guinevere, those lips, moulded by love's own hand, are not yet doomed for death's embrace. Their kiss is for a king yet not like that dead lord whose bloodless soul wings to a frozen heaven who woos thee now is man not god and in his brimming veins runs longings like thine own i thought till now that i had suffered all but here i see my shame doth but begin twas not enough that through my sin for all succeeding time hell's mocking laugh shall haunt the voice of spring and plant its poisoned echo in each bower where lover's vows are sworn. Nay, this is more, that she, whom love doth once make false to love, must henceforth bear the common brand of lust, seeming the painted toy that every man may purchase at his price. Why, thou dost dream? Here at thy feet I lay an empire's throne, where thou in equal majesty shall reign once more a queen. A wanton, not a queen, who for this piece of gold thou call'st a crown would take thy murderous kiss? Nay, have care. My love lies near to hate. I fear thy love. Thy hate is not. Truth, thou shalt find it more than thou hast ever dreamed. Shouts without, Long live the king! Dost hear that cry? It is the echoing voice of England's knights, who hail me king. And they were Arthur's knights. Ay, they loved Arthur well. Yet when they learn, as so they shall, for I will vouch it true, t'was Lancelot's sword did pierce him to the heart, their eyes will turn on her whose shameful sin made Lancelot false. See then, thy fate stands clear, thou art death's bride, or mine, thy choice is free. Why then I choose to die. Yea, though my soul slip down to hell, hell were a paradise whilst thou art here. Exit Guinevere. By heaven, then thou shalt die. Enter Morgan. Ryan's is trapped, and dying hath confessed his treason and thine own. Then Arthur lives, and all is lost. Nay, all is left to win. This news is secret, and long ere tis known thy sword shall pierce his heart. Or his sword mine. What? Wouldst thou question fate? He Pendragon's son shall slay that is born with the May. 
so fate decreed his blood is thine and mine shouts long live king mordred death to guinevere grow louder to the end go take thy crown and none shall dare to question what is done or remains to do exit so fate take all to halt were death and that oncoming flood of time's uplifted wave can hold no more. Exit. Scene two. The Great Hall at Camelot. As the scene is disclosed, the hall is filled with armed knights. Mordred is on the throne, accompanied by Morgan, and surrounded by the retinue of the court. Guinevere stands before the throne. Mordred turns to her. By England's knights in council, thou dost stand condemned of treason against thy lord the king, whose death lies at thy charge. Yet we, who bear the crown that Arthur wore, now give thee leave to plead in thy defence. If there be aught which thou canst urge why judgment should be stayed, stand forth and speak. We pray you hear her not. Guinevere, turning with a look of scorn towards Mordred. What still is left to say is not for thee. Then let the sentence go, Queen Guinevere, daughter of Leodegrounce of Cornwall. Now hear thy judgment as the law decrees, that first, despoiled of thy royal robes, thou shalt be fastened to an iron stake until thy mortal body be consumed in fiery flames. And saith the law no more? Ay, this it adds that if thy prayer may win some champion for thy cause, then this same knight shall claim due right of battle against that lord whose charge hath brought thee here. And who is that? Tis I who charge thee now. Why then, sir knights, I'll kneel and pray to you, if haply one find heart to serve his queen. Think not I plead for this poor gift of life. Nay, could I choose these hands should bear fresh faggots to the blaze that lights me to a tomb. Yet hear me all. Who stands my knight to-day shall rest from time a crown of glory. Not, sirs, that he fought for one whose sin knows no desert save death. That were but shame. Yet whoso dares that shame, his sword shall win the right, denied him else, to slay that crawling thing upon thy throne. Wherefore I cry a champion for my cause. Mordred, who has descended from the throne, whispers aside. Too late my queen too late what wouldst thou give to win a king's kiss now doth no one speak then herald let the trumpet's tongue bray out her knight is gone a hawking or perchance he sleeps too late the trumpet sounds and at the third call sir bedivere breaks through the throng and stands before mordred hold there sir herald hither comes a knight to answer for the queen who is this knight Sir, by your leave that shall be better told when all is done. The knights give way, and Arthur stands alone with lowered helm. See, madam, where he stands, thy champion, who must needs have come from far to answer in such cause. Guinevere kneels at Arthur's feet. I thank thee, sir, yet now I do repent me of what's done, and fain would set thee free. Put up thy sword. I am not worthy that a true knight's blood should flow for me. See, I will tell thee all. I had a champion once, the mightiest knight, the bravest and the truest in the world. He was my lord, and I his chosen queen, brought him to shame. Then wherefore praise him now? Nay, sir, I must, for that is life's hard law, which will not yield its secret till the close. When Arthur went, the sun shot scarlet red, and all the past lay bare. Then pray thee, sir, put up thy sword that waits a worthier cause. A pause, but Arthur makes no sign. Thou wilt not? Then I'll ask this much of thee. When death shall call thee home, it so may chance that thou shalt meet my lord. If that should be, give him this word, that at the end his queen knew him for what he was, true lord of all. Go! Lead her hence. So God defend our king. Exit Guinevere, followed by Agravaine and knights. Mordred turns to Arthur, who remains motionless, Morgan watching him intently from the steps of the throne. Sir Bedivere stands by Arthur. And now I'm thine. Yet first, 
by heaven i'll know the face beneath that mask twas kept for thee as he lifts his helm mordred starts back the king ay sir the king who but to win this little hour from out the wreck of time would take life's wearied hand and travel back across the ruined past should fate declare that only so his sword might claim the right to slay thee now prate on i fear thee not thou hast forgot the message of the may then hear it now enough twas thou false witch that stole the scabbard of excalibur yet see the blade remains whose every stroke is winged by death not so not so my lord that fickle steel shall splinter as it falls on one twice armed by fate he pendragon's son shall slay that is born with the may see there he stands why then the end is here said on sir knight death stands betwixt us twain and death shall choose they fight and arthur is wounded traitor that blow ends all he falls to the earth long live the king the trumpet is heard without dost hear that sound nay look not on what's done there's more to do her soul shall join with his to wing its way across night's starless sky exeunt morgan and mordred and as they go they are greeted by cries from without long live the king nay sirs it is not for long i'm dying bedivere where is my sword there in thy hand poor hand that knew it not go quickly bedivere and bear it hence unto that little bay hid in the cliff then cast it in the sea to wait the day when upward from the shrieking waves shall spring a vast sea-brood of mightier strain than ours bearing across the world from end to end one cry to all our sword is in the sea why then tis done he takes sword and goes off life's tide is ebbing fast gawain enters hurriedly nay what is here the wreck of all the world peace sir i know thy news the queen is dead not so she lives and thou art well avenged by one who dying struck thy murderer down didst know him gawain i i knew him once the courtliest knight that ever bare a shield the sternest soldier to his mortal foe yet gentlest of us all nay sir his name his name my lord was lancelot lancelot ah oh, so life's long night is breaking at the last guinevere enters while the figure of merlin appears standing above the recumbent form of arthur where is that knight who died that i might live hush lady here he is she sees the face of arthur and falls at his feet my lord my lord whose face was there i pray you someone say for all goes dark i know not where i am her name was guinevere what sirs why then this should be cameliard rousing himself with sudden energy see tis the spring down in the vale the blossoms of the may are swinging in the sun and there she stands that shall be england's queen far up i hear the ceaseless beating of death's restless wing and round mine eyes the circling veil of night grows deeper as it falls henceforth my sword rests in its scabbard what remains is peace he falls back dead he's gone the light of all the world lies dead the stage darkens leaving a light only on the face of merlin not so he doth but pass who cannot die the king that was the king that yet shall be whose spirit borne along from age to age is england's to the end look where the dawn sweeps through a wider heaven 
and on its wings by those three queens of night his barge is borne to that sweet isle of avalon whose sleep can heal all earthly wounds during this speech the stage grows darker and as the vision appears at the back of arthur born in the barge with the three queens bending over his body the chorus breaks out and continues till the end sleep oh sleep till night outworn wakens to the echoing horn that shall greet thee king newborn king that was and is to be and a voice from shore to shore cries arise and sleep no more greet the dawn the night is o'er England's sword is in the sea. End of Act 4 End of King Arthur, A Drama in a Prologue and Four Acts by Joseph Commons Carr